Okay. Um, so what I just gave you were was the what we're going to do today, the top half, and then tomorrow we're going to do the bottom half of the reading assignment, and then some of uh, the PowerPoints that I could potentially use as we go through this. A little bit about naming um, con naming alkyl groups, which we'll talk about kind of as a reference, and then looking at the alkanes, introduction to alkanes, and then we go to um, talking about cyclics, and then the <clears throat> sort of practice problems, and the answers to those are online. So, um, and the answer, and I'll and I'll show you. There's also a narrated answer key for each one of those. So I'll show you how to manipulate that, and I'll also send out an email at the end um, after class with just a refresher on how to get that. Because for these homework problems, you can actually have me talk you through them in addition to seeing it on paper. But I have to show you how to do that. Okay, so today the main topics are talking about alkanes, cyclic alkanes and rings, non-cyclic alkanes, no rings. And the first thing that in chapter two they talk about is how to name these. Now this book does all of the naming in chapter two. And I tried that and we're not gonna do that. We're gonna break the naming up to every time we talk about a new group we're going to talk about um, the naming of that group. So we're not going to talk about all the naming at once. I know that that wasn't all that effective. So did you have any questions from the stuff that you read, Ellie? Well, if, um, so we're not going to do all the naming. Should we still, like, there's, like, homework and stuff that goes with, like, all the names. Yeah, so you're just going to do chat. You're just going to do the problems that are between, like, 2.0 and 2.5. Okay. And then after that, we'll come back and pick it up. There's no deadline on the problems. So I'll have to figure out how to grade them. But because we'll go back when we talk about the alkenes, the double bonds, we'll go back and I'll sign those problems. So, so yeah, only, only the 2.0 to 2.5. And then for today, and I said in my email, I'm, I'm violating the rules here because you're supposed to be very clear, concise. Your assignments are supposed to be, you have no doubt as to what I'm asking for. You have doubts as to what I'm asking for. Um, I think it's, I think if you want to do the problems as you're reading through the book, that's fine. If you want to wait until after we go over it in class and then go back and do them, that's fine too. So I'll, com so I'll basically make all the problems for that week due by Friday at midnight. Now, that I don't believe that these are on Chegg, if you know what Chegg is. Did you already look? I checked. Yeah, there were a few that I didn't know how to do. So I use Sapling Electronic Homeworks until I asked the Sapling company, well, students are telling me you like are in cahoots with Chegg. And they didn't answer me for about 30 seconds. It was just crickets. And they said, well, Chegg's another company. And I said, why don't, you, why don't you sue them out of business? My legal team would, my legal team, I would own Chegg right now if I, if I was concerned about it. And they said, well, it's not that easy. And, but remember, if you just get the answers from Chegg, you're not learning. But you're referring to the questions that are in Yeah, there's, there's, there are websites that you can pay $15 a month access and get answers to everything. I even heard that there's an ex that there you can like when you're taking a test you can take a picture of the test and send it off somewhere and they'll send you back the test with the answers on it. I mean I thought I was up to date on stuff, but apparently this happens like down at Cleveland State and <sighs> you're not learning. So. So there's two there's two types of there's two types of problems here. There's when I look at chapter two, there's a first one that says that has the the questions within the chapter itself. Those ones I'm asking you to do. 
There is also a homework problem, which I think you would access this way. It's a separate tab. These ones are just there for your practice, for you to practice on. But the problem is we're all in multiple choice format. The only multiple choice format exam that you're going to take will be the final exam. So that's why I'm giving you these other written problems, because that's what you're going to see on the exam. Now, this problem right here, maybe we'll do this problem. Because that's a pretty good problem, except I'm going to give you that alkane, and I'm going to say name it, and I'm not going to give you the, um, the multiple choice answers to choose from. So that's how, so that's how it, um, that's the difference. So these problems that are in the second tab are available because I have to make them available to you because you're going to keep this book forever. So in theory, if you want to go back and, and look at these again, you can. But these are not going to be graded or not due as participation. They're just there for you to do on your own. Can I ask a question about the question? Yes. Um, it's number 2.18. Okay. So, what, so we'll go over questions you have on the nomenclature. So let's see, 2.18. So one thing I wish they had was all was a quick tab to the problems. So I got it right because I was able to it was like a matching one. Okay. I was able to figure out one and two. But the three uh, oh. It's coming. Um I'll do question five. So what questions did you have while it's slow? Even mine is slow. What questions do you have about, did you have initially about the naming? Yeah. So I think, like, the naming makes sense to me, but the, the branch and using the, the common versus what it is, like, one that felt out there makes sense to me, but how you, is it just a matter of the station that it's like so focal? Yes, but there is sort of a system to it, so we should we'll talk we should talk about the common names because they still use one methyl ethyl and that has n that's no longer being used by the IUPAC people. And I'll and I can explain why in a moment. So here's eighteen. So here's question eighteen. Um, yeah, so when I answered it, the explanation said it was like correct, only one molecule has an isotope like propyl group. And I was confused for why number two the it doesn't was have considered a, yeah. an isopropyl okay. group and not number three. So okay. So the reason is because the what looks like the isopropyl group, this if you look at these, you immediately say, well, here's an isopropyl group and here's an isopropyl group. But it must be that one of those two isopropyl groups is part of the longest chain when you name it. And that, so that isopropyl group then disappears from the name. So let's start from scratch. OK. So our rules for naming are going to be, and I'm going to come here. And just kind of give, and just kind of say, outline that I'm sure the book said there are two different systems that you can use for naming alkanes and other functional groups. What's called the IUPAC method, which is from the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. They have decided the rules such that if you use their rules, you will get one and only one name for the molecule. And that's because basically any chemist in the world will name that compound the same. Or they will draw the structure from that name exactly the same. So there has to be a standard method of naming and that's what the IUPAC system does. So in the book when they talked about well you can name you can name a group one methyl ethyl or you can name it isopropyl, that violates that rule. 
because now we've got two different names with two different alphabetizations for those for those groups and so that's why the IUPAC group a few years ago said all the common names up to like five and six we're going to accept as IUPAC names so there is no more one methyl ethyl it's all isopropyl okay. so that's the reason why they did that in this book I'm a little surprised that they haven't edited this out and I may have made a comment that said the IUPAC no longer accepts 1-F-methyl ethyl. Now, if it's something that doesn't have a common name, then we, we can name it by that system, and I'll come back to that. So the six common names that were in the book, are those the only ones that we need to know? So I think so, because I think they came from my list. Okay. Um, so let's look at my list here. <coughs> so there's the PowerPoints. Where is my... So here is, and this, and this is in this. These are in the packets. So here, here is the list of groups and their accepted names. So we, I basically organized these: one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon, and five carbon. So methyl is IUPAC. Ethyl is IUPAC. And propyl is now IUPAC. The N stood for normal, which means it was a straight cane, but that's actually not in vogue anymore. Um, so it's just propyl. But if you write N propyl, that's okay. I mean, it's been a few years. The, one of the last, one of the papers I submitted, I said N butyl, and the referee yelled at me because he's like, you can't be doing. And propyl because that's like saying the the and we don't use that anymore and I'm like okay I'll erase it just leave me alone so there is no more n it's just propyl is assumed to be straight chain then isopropyl and if we want to talk about sort of the system that people used for this there is a system to the common names First of all, the total number of carbons gives you the meth gives you whether it's propyl or butyl or pentyl. This CH3 CH CH3 group, whenever you see that in a group, that's what we call the iso group. Now, this isn't IUPAC, this is just sort of a common name they put a system to it. So, whenever you see that, it's going to be iso. Then we have for four carbons, we have the straight chain group, which is butyl. Then here's a butyl group of four carbons that has the CH3, CH, CH3 group. So that's isobutyl. Here is a branch chain of four carbons that's now a butyl group. And so now that butyl group, we have to identify what type of carbon is attached the attachment point for that butyl group and so in order to do that you have to take a, a diversion into what is a primary what is a secondary and what is a tertiary and what is a quaternary carbon so bless you what that means is you'd look at that carbon as the attachment point how many other carbons is it attached to if it's attached to one, it's primary. If it's attached to two, it's secondary. Three, it's tertiary. And four, it's quaternary. Here's the tricky part with these groups. First of all, is anybody sitting there going, what are these groups attached to? Those groups are attached to a longest chain in the molecule. So once you find the longest chain, we're going to circle that and we're going to name every group that's attached to that longest chain. So this group by itself, that carbon is attached to two other ones, which makes it secondary. And so when I call that secondary butyl, what I mean is that's the butyl group where the attachment point in that group is a secondary carbon. 
So that's a secondary butyl group. So then, is there another way I can arrange those four carbon, that those four carbons, I can, I can now arrange it where the attachment point of the four carbons is now, the tertiary carbon. And so that's what makes a tertiary butyl or a tertiary butyl. Now, once that carbon is attached to the carbon of the longest chain, it's a quaternary carbon, but we're only looking at it as if it was the group and we're ignoring that it's attached to something else. So that's, that's a sort of a systematic way of way the common names were developed. So what I'd like to do is this. If you're thinking about, well, I mean, you have to memorize these. I know, that's the bad one. We're not supposed to use the M word for memorize. I'm supposed to say you're supposed to learn these, which just means you memorize it. But there is a system to it. So it's not just, so what I do is I'll say, okay, if I wanted to write the, the groups, the butyl groups, I first, think, first I start with the straight chain. Then I write the ISO. So if you're looking at this saying, okay, what is it? Is it a straight chain? No. Does it have an ISO group and the ISO has to be CH3, CH, CH3? If it has an ISO group in it, it's going to be an ISO. Then after that, it's just either going to be a secondary or a tertiary. So that's kind of the systematic way of going down through these groups. If we do the pentals, we have a straight chain pentyl, which is pentyl, or n-pentyl. Then we have a pentyl with the iso group in it, again, CH3, CH, CH3. So that's isopentyl. We can arrange these so there's a terse pentyl. And we can arrange it so that there is a new type of group. And this is the only way I can imagine somebody came up with this name. Because in the common name system, whoever named it and that name was accepted, that's how it was named. So this when somebody goes, oh, that's a new one, so let's call it neopentyl. That, I mean, it makes sense. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's, that's the way I think about it. So a neopentyl has the CH2 then attached. And you can say, why is that not iso? It's not iso because there's no CH3, CH, CH3. It's got to be those those three atoms in order to be iso, and that's not iso. And then there might be a hexyl one, but I didn't put that in, so you don't have to worry about that. So these are the groups that you have to know. They're common names of. So if these show up as a, as a group attached to the longest chain, you have to use these names in order to name them. So while the book says one methyl ethyl is fine, it's not anymore. Some of the problems that I gave you, you may see in the answer key that I use both names. That's because I just adopted the no more one methyl ethyl rule recently. And the reason, and the reason why it's just not accepted is because there's, there can be up to four or five different names. And that's not what IUPAC wants. They want one name that everybody uses. There may be differences in language, but the format will be the same. So for these ones, the IUPAC people have accepted those as the name. So in, I gave you a copy of this handout and it's and all of this stuff is in today's folder if you were keeping if you have like the clicker or if you have the ringer on every time I add something it tells you by text or something I was adding stuff until kind of late last night because I was finding stuff in my it's, the organization needs a little bit of work so I was trying to find all the stuff and organize it 
but in the yellow here, these are all the ones that they've accepted. They call radical, in the official language, they call it a radical as a substituent or as the group that's attached to the longest chain. So you can see they actually have an isohexyl that they also consider. And of course they accept hexyl as the longest chain. And so this is directly from what's called the IUPAC Blue Book, which is nomenclature for organic molecules. So that's the first thing, is how do we name these groups that are attached to the longest chain? So there is a system to it, but if you want to just blow past the system. Um, so what's the difference between like methane, ethane, propane, and ethyl? Okay, so the difference, the difference is that those are those are basically what we would call um, alkanes. So when you have the A and E ending, when you have the A and E ending, that means that that's the longest chain and that's going to be the parent name. What to make an alkyl group the way the way you do this is you say okay I have a CH4 that's methane and if I take away a carbon I now make that group a substituent and so now methane becomes methyl to indicate that that group is now a substituent and so ethane take a hydrogen away it becomes ethyl and so that's the difference between the A-N-E ending and the Y-L. The Y-L means that's a substituent to the long, to the overall molecule. No? Any question? Oh, so let's, we're working our way to that. We're working our way. I have, I, I'd say I haven't forgotten about it, but I did. So we're working our way towards that. And so that's where the names come from. So then the issue is, how do we name an alkane? What are the steps? So on that same sheet where there is that I hand wrote out all of the alkyl groups. I then, at the bottom corner here, I outlined the procedure, and I may have done this in the textbook. I may have outlined the steps as well. I, may, I would have outlined them. So here's the steps. Oh, sorry, that's the steps for IUPAC naming alkyl groups. The steps for naming alkyl groups are going to be in the first PowerPoint. So we'll go back to top hat and I'll transfer I'll transfer your structure over and then we'll name it. So here are the longest, here's the steps. So first of all, we have to find the longest continuous carbon chain in the molecule. And so that's going to give us the parent name. So if we have a carbon chain of nine, that's going to become a nonane. And then all the groups attached to that nonane are going to have to be given a number and their name. So I've got a methyl group at carbon three. There's going to be a three methyl nonane. I've got an ethyl group at carbon three. It's going to be three ethyl nonane. So the name tells you the group and where it's attached on the longest chain. So the first thing is find the longest chain. And if there's more than one group, then we have to add a, a, a prefix that tells us how many of those groups there are. Now in here what it says is it's prefix for the number of carbons in the chain, so we go meth, f, pro, three, bute, pent, x, 
kept, right? It's not set, it's kept. Then opt, non, and deck. And then after that, I'll give it to you. If it's 11, it's like uni. If it's 12, it's do deck, I believe. So you'll see in one of the in one of the problems we'll do, I, I give you anything above eleven. Because you have to basically have to look those up. We use everything between ten and below. And the reason that these molecules are A and E, so the reason it's a butane or a hexane, the A and E suffix on the on the name tells us, okay, that's a count. It's a carbon with only carbons and hydrogens and single bonds. When we get to double bonds, it'll become an ENE because that says you have a double bond. And if you have a triple bond, it'll become a YNE to say, okay, you've got a triple bond. So that's the first thing. We've got to find the longest chain. So let's go back to the let's go back to the top hat to problem 18 here. And let's do let's let's look at number one. We'll do one and we'll do two and then we'll do three. Okay, so if we do number one what I have to do is I've gotta get that structure right. like that and then I think that's it right is that it there's too many. One too long? Okay. Okay. So, we got to find the longest continuous carbon chain in the molecule. And then, what I like to do is I like to circle that because then I'll tell you what the substituents are. So, what is the longest, how many carbons? is the longest carbon chain, and more importantly, where do we start and end? Eight from left to right, straight across. We all agree with that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, close, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have to try all the combinations. And there is no rule that says it has to go straight across. It can go zigzag, it can go U shaped, but you've got to find the longest continuous part of the chain. So in this case, it's straight across. Now, in the problem, they have isopropyl as a potential name, right? So the way you could name this is you could find the one that has the isopropyl group, but let, let's write out the name explicitly. So for this one, that's eight carbons, so this is going to be an octane. Okay. But what's attached? to that octane chain. Well, what's this, what are these two groups and what's this group? Now, I would suggest that if you can't look at this and say this is a, the one right here. 
I don't know. There's a little tiny thing there, isn't there? Not on yours. On this one. Not full. But if you're looking at that going, I need the hydrogens, that's fine. Take a moment. Now, in the in chapter one, one of the things was this is what's called a shorthand structure. Because we jumped right away from writing CH3, CH2, CH2 to drawing lines. So how do we interpret this? We interpret this as every end of a line and every intersection of lines as a carbon atom, unless it's written as a nitrogen or oxygen. So that means the end of this line is a carbon. How many hydrogens does it get? Enough to give you four bonds. Enough to give you four bonds. So that carbon has one bond, it needs three hydrogens. This carbon down here, intersection between the lines, how many hydrogens does it need to get? The one right here. How many hydrogens do I have to add to it? One, because it's got three bonds, so it needs one hydrogen to get it to four bonds. So every intersection between the lines is a carbon atom, and then you add enough, enough hydrogens to get you four bonds. So if you have to do that with a structure like this, take a minute and do it. And I strongly recommend doing it on the substituents because until you're in your mind you're kind of adding the carbons and adding the hydrogens automatically, you may have to add those on paper. So here's a carbon. How many hydrogens should go on it? Three. Up here there's two carbons. How many carbons on the first hydrogen? On this one? Two. And on this one? Three. So take a moment and do that. So now we can name the groups. So in my, in my sequence of naming here, the first thing I do is find the longest chain. Then I'm going to name the substituents. The substituents of the groups attach to the longest chain. And you can use a highlighter to highlight the longest chain. You could circle it like this. I don't normally like to change colors, although it looks like if you're into colors, you've got multiple pens out. So, otherwise you got the pens they have to click back and forth on. It's like the erasers, they're just everybody's clicking. There's my longest chain, so what's this group? What's this group right here? A, what kind of group? Methyl. And there's another one, right? That's a methyl group. And what's this one? Ethyl. Now why do I name it first? Because my next step is going to be, I have to tell you where those groups are, which means I have to number the longest chain. And if we get into tie breaking, it's always based on alphabetization. So if it's based on alphabetization, I need to know what the name is first. So, longest chain, name the substituents. Now, we're going to number this chain, and we only have two ways to do it, left to right, right to left. What are the rules for numbering the chain? I'm gonna, let's see, I'm kind of skipping ahead here in the notes. So, locate the longest chain. There's tiebreakers. If there's more than one longest chain, then you have to choose the one that gives you the most number of substituents or the most number of branches. That's the tiebreaker there. If we have to go beyond that tiebreaker, like there's multiple chains and they have the same number of substituents, then I give you whichever answer you want to write. Okay. But there is, there is a third rule here, and I think it's you have to use the chain, the numbering that would give the first substituent the lowest alphabetization, but I don't usually go into that rule. 
Once you've located the longest chain, number it from the end closest to the first substituent. So I want the first substituent to get to lowest number. But then there's tiebreakers here. So if more than one substituent is closest, then you number from the end closest to the first alphabetized substituent. So let me just take a step back here, because there's actually another tiebreaker that isn't here. What if I had, coming in from both ends, I come in one carbon, there's two substituents on one side and one substituent on the other. The two substituent twins. So first of all, it doesn't matter about alphabetization, it's those two substituents win. If there's one and one or two and two, then the first alphabetized substituent from the end, that wins the priority, so it goes one and then two, two being the, the first alphabetized substituent. So if there's two at one side and one at the other, that two automatically wins. After that, we go to alphabetization. And then we name number the substituents. So let's go back. So how am I going to name this? Right to left or left to right? Left to right? So if I number from left to right, it's one, two, three to find the first substituent. If I was to number from right to left, it would be one, two, three, and four. So it's got to be left to right. And then my four, then my five, then my six, seven, and eight. Now one of the things, because I don't know how many thousands of these problems I've graded through the years, and it's into at least at least four figures, if not five, at this point. You want to make sure that if you said the longest chain was an octane, that you have one through eight. Because sometimes you forget one. And if you forget a number, then that's going to make the name wrong. Is there partial credit for this? Yes but you want maximum credit. We don't want to settle for partial credit. So I've got my eight carbons. Now let's go ahead and write the names. So this is going to be something, something, something octane. So now I'm going to create a list with number, substituent, and then I'm just going to create that list down the line. The number comes first with a dash. So in this case, I have two methyl groups so I combine all the groups that are the same. And when I combine the groups that are the same, I'm going to use a prefix of di, tri, tetra, and then it would be penta, and hexa, and hepta. So it's kind of the same, the same ones except di and tri. So in this case, I've got two methyl groups at carbons three and four. So I have a, whoa. How do I undo that? Okay, that's good. How do I get rid of this thing? There's going to be a, this is going to be a three comma four dash dimethyl is the first set of groups. And then what's next? A five ethyl. So if you want to, you can create the list of the groups and the numbers. Now when I put that in front of the octane, I'm going to create an alphabetized list. So we're going to talk about alphabetization here. What's alphabetized and what's not? Do I alphabetize the die? No. 
di tri tetra are not optimized. So for di ethyl, or sorry, ethyl is based on E, di methyl is based on M. While I'm on while I'm on alphabetization, let's. The problem with this stuff is we have to take like a diversion here, then a diversion here, then a diversion here, and then bring it all back together. So since we're talking about alphabetization, what gets alphabetized? So if let's say I had a sec butyl group, what would you alphabetize in sec butyl? I mean, you can answer that if you'd like, otherwise it's a rhetorical question. Okay, it's a rhetorical question. So, here's how I remember what to alphabetize. Anything that has a, a hyphen in its name, what comes before the hyphen does not count. So, for sec, tersh, if we were still using N, they do not count for alphabetization because they are hyphenated. The hyphenated words are always based on what comes after the hyphen. Secbutyl. So in this case, secbutyl would be alphabetized on B. What about isopropyl? Well, since there's no hyphen, and since it's all one word, anything that has all one word is going to be alphabetized on the first letter. So isopropyl being all one word is going to be the I. And we'll come back. What if I have a complex substituent that doesn't have a common name accepted by IUPAC and I have to write like a one ethyl butyl group. Then how do I alphabetize? I'll come back to that. So hyphenated, after the hyphen, all one word, first letter. Do you alphabetize die and try? Not unless it's, lot, not unless it's in parentheses, and I'll come back to the parentheses in a minute, because like parentheses, we haven't done that yet. No, we haven't. We will. Okay, so now which comes first? In this case, now we're back to our problem. It's going to be ethyl based in E, 3, 4 dimethyl based in M. So this is going to be, this, the final name of this is going to be 5 methyl. 3, 4, di, methyl, octane. Without the M. That's good. You caught me right away. So 5-ethyl-3-4-dimethyl-octane. If you want to check yourself, I could, I could give you two kinds of problems. I could give you the name and say write the structure, or I could just give you the structure and have you write the name. When I give the name and have people write the structure, it's like 99% of people get it right. So do I give those? Mm, it's a few. But what you could do is you could say, what does that name mean? So I'm going to write eight carbons, eight carbon chain. I'm going to write an ethyl group of five and two methyl groups, one at three and one at four. Now, what about this dimethyl? What if this was a three, three dimethyl? What if I had two methyl groups of carbon three? You have to, if you say that there's a dimethyl group, you need two numbers. Because if you were writing the name and you had a 3-dimethyl, the first thing you'd go is, well, where do I put the other methyl group? And there are, there's no guessing here. If you have to guess on the name, it's wrong. Because two people could write two different answers. And then IUPAC says, one name, and that's it. 
So if you have a dimethyl, you need two numbers, even if they're the same number. Because that's what tells you where to put the two methyls. So if you're unsure, after you write the name, write the structure out, and then you know hide the first structure with your hand or whatever, and then compare. And that's an easy way to double check your answer. So, we so what do we need to know? We need to know this these steps, longest chain. Not name the substituents, combine them together, and then number from the end closest to the first substituent. If you're tied, the greater number of substituents, if that is tied, then we go to um, first alphabetize. And we can and we can come up with all sorts of um, We can come up with all sorts of what if scenarios here. So for instance, let me just let's go through a couple of those. So let's say I have this molecule. So first question is going to be, what's the longest continuous part of chain? How many carbons? Do we all agree six? Where do you want to start? Um, Start at A. So from A, you want to go A to E? One. So if we go A to E, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we could go from A to E, and that would be six carbons. Where do you want to go? D to C? Okay, so going from A to D is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And going from A to C is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Well, so what we're doing is we're stepping through this. So. Are there any other common? Are there any other um, pathways that give us six? Hannah, D to A. Okay, E to A. Okay, so when we have A to E, that also means E to A, because that's going to be where. Do, how do we number it? Left to right, right to left. So when you say A to E, that No, actually, in this case, because we're stepping through this. My when I, when A to E, I'm going to interpret A to B, A to E to be either A to E or E to A. So either one, because we're we're kind of identifying the longest chain. Then we have this issue of we got more than one longest chain, so we've got to decide which one. Then we have to number the uh, name the groups, and then we'll number it. So right now we won't worry about whether it starts at A or starts at E. I just want to know what the longest carbon chains are possible. Uh, B to E, okay. Okay. Uh, 
guy. Any other combinations that give us six? So we have six different combinations here, and only one of those can be right. Well, actually, let's deal with, do I start at A or do I start at B? Does it matter? Now, let's just say for the sake of argument that I'm going to start carbon number one at A. I may not, but just let's just assume that. So if I started at carbon A and I went one, two, that means there'd be a two methyl group here, right? If I started at carbon B and went one and two, there would still be two methyl group. So whether so whenever you have a carbon that branches out, if you have the same two groups, it's not going to matter which of those two groups you start with or include as the longest chain because they're going to give the same name. And even if, even if you say, well, okay, so carbon A and carbon B aren't number one, what if they're I don't know, number six? Then you would still have a five methyl if you came here, or if you came down, it would still be five methyl. So if there was an ethyl group here, if there was like an ethyl group here and a methyl group there, that's going to be different. Those two ends, you're going to have different to start here or start here. But when you have the same group branching off of a carbon, it doesn't matter what group you start with. Does everybody see that? So in this case, all the B to E's, B to D's, and B to C's, they're all going to give the same name as an A to C, A to D, or A to B. So, they're going to be the same. Now, the issue of going from A to E, I now have to break the tie. And how am I going to break the tie? Oh, we could have had the same thing with D and E on the other side, right? This D, the D and E here. I could start or end with D, or I could start or end with E, and it would be the same. So I'm going to write, just because it's going to get awfully confusing, I'm going to write three different structures here, and now let's circle the longest chains. So now let's go from A to E. And from A to E, how many substituents do I have? Three. Um, if I go A to D, How many substituents do I have? Three. I've got the B, the C, and the E. And if I do A to C, how many substituents do I have? Two. So if I go, so with A to C then, there's only two substituents. So I can eliminate that one, right? Because that doesn't give you the most number of substituents. That's our tiebreaker. If we have more than one longest chain, the tiebreaker is which one gives us the most number of substituents. So A to C is out. A to E and A to D, they're in. Now, did I screw this up? No. It, if I go A to D or A to E, am I going to get the same answer? Actually, yes, because in this case, whether I end at D or whether I end at E, since they were both methyl groups when they branched out, it doesn't matter which way I number. So I can number A to D or A to E, it's all the same. So it doesn't matter like well, let's name them. Let's name them both and see if that happens. If it did, then 
if it if these give two different names, then you could name me the one I'd give you credit for. Because this is going into a rule that I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe in the fall I'll enforce that rule, but not now. So let's name so let's so let's name the group. So so what do I have? What what groups do I have? What are my substituents? It looks like I have two two methyls. And an and one methyl. So I've got a di methyl, and then I have an ethyl, right? Just like before. So now we got to put numbers in front of those. So for the first one, A to D, um, how should I number? Should I? Start at A, or should I start at D? Which carbon gets which carbon gets the number one? Gets number one, A or D? E. Okay, I got an A and I got a D. So, so far our tiebreaker has been we want a number from the end closest to the first substituent, but what if I start over here and my first substituent's a methyl and I start over here and my first substituent's a methyl on tied? Now what, what should I do? Let's continue on into the chain. And now we're, whichever substituent we encounter first, that's going to win. So in other words, when I go 1, 2, and there's a methyl, 1, 2, and there's a methyl, let's continue on. So I've got a 1, 2 with a methyl, but now I'd have a 3-ethyl. If I came over here, I would have a 1, 2, and it would be a 3-4-ethyl. So I want to so I want to continue numbering at the end closest to the first substituent, but now I want to continue on. So that means that it's going to start at D, and it's going to go 1, 2, 3, four, five, and six. So in other words, if the two substituents closest to the end are the same, continue on until you find that point of difference. The point of difference could be the first substituent or the substituent closest to that end. And if you had a tie there, use alphabetization to break that. And if you keep going and everything's the same, then the molecule's symmetric and it doesn't matter. Is it the same for both of them? So you're so you're moving ahead here. I just want is everybody is everybody okay with that? Why ethyl is why I'm gonna go start at D and go one, two, three with the three group being ethyl. Is everybody okay with that? So now if we do that with the second molecule in the middle, where am I gonna number? One, two over here would be one, two methyl, but then the ethyl is closer to the end, the right end, so this is one, two, three. So do they have the same name? They they will have the same name. Which okay, so ethyl comes before dimethyl. So what number goes in front of the ethyl? It's going to be a 3-ethyl, and then dimethyl is going to be what? 2 and 5 dimethyl, and then this is ultimately a hexane. So 3-ethyl, 2,5 dimethyl hexane. And that would be the same whether I went from A to B or A to B. So. Okay. So, so that gets us to our next point, which is 
that the I could have written that structure um, multiple ways. So let me just show you if it's a three ethyl. So I could write my six carbon chain, right? So there's a six carbon chain. So I just know I have to have a methyls at two and five. Two, five, and my ethyl at three. So that's the same molecule. These are Lewis dot structures. So I'm, I'm, even, I'm going to even write it a different way. That's the same molecule. That's the same molecule. And this is gonna this is gonna kind of take us into the other topic for the day, which is gonna be okay. So these are Lewis dot structures. This is this all three of these are the equivalent of writing water like this. Right? When we write Lewis dot structures, it's this a connectivity. We're not showing the shape. We're not showing a three-dimensional shape. And so all three of those Lewis dot structures are water. All of these basic Lewis dot structures that I've written for that alkane, they're all the same. <coughs> so once, once you understand that, then it doesn't matter the way you would draw it. You could draw, you could draw there's probably even more combinations than that. So all of those are the same, are the same molecule. Ultimately, how do I know the molecules, two molecules are going to be the same? Because they have the same name. So we're going to use that test throughout the semester and year, that if you, write, that if you have two molecules and you don't know if they're the same or not, first thing I'm going to say is name them. If they have the same IUPAC name, they are the same molecule. So that's kind of how we name. And I'm going to throw in, just for fun, three more substituents. Because this is boring. With just alkanes, these are boring. So what I like to do is I like to say, what if there was a bromine? What if there was a chlorine? What if there was a fluorine attached? Those are substituents. They're going to be treated just like methyl, ethyl, propyl, etc. But what are their names? Bromo, chloro, fluoro, and if it was iodine, it would be iodo. Alphabetized on B, C, F, and I. So in the problems, you'll see, sometimes you'll see nothing but alkane. But sometimes you'll see I've thrown in a bromo and a chloro. It just it gives me more problems to choose from. But we might as well learn how to name those. So that's our naming. We, did, we still didn't answer your question about the top oh, that, did we?
So let's just go back there and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll put the there. So for this one, what did we just name this? What did we just name the first one? It was a 5 ethyl 3 4 dimethyl, right? So that's C. So number one is C. So for number two, and I know this is hard to do. I would never try and do this on on the screen. I would break that. Uh, so am I? So for that one, so for that one, I guess if you're if you're doing a multiple if you were doing this as a multiple choice test, you just have to figure out whether the isopropyl group is part of the longest chain or not. But for this one, it's going to be so for that one, what's the longest chain? Going all the way across, left to right. Yeah. How many carbons? Eight. Eight. Do we agree? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anything close to that? Anything? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like that's the longest chain. And again, while that might catch your eye to begin with, I'm pretty good at hiding the longest chain when I want to be. So it may you've got to check all the combinations. But that's clearly the eight carbon chain. So what do you how do you want to number it? Left, right, right, left. Agreed, left to right. We all agree. So one, two, three. We found our first substituent. One, two, three, four. So looks good to me. All agree. Okay. So what are our substituents? So what do we have at three? A methyl group. What do we have at four? methyl group, what do we have at five? The isopropyl. So which comes first, the dimethyl or the isopropyl? The isopropyl comes first. So isopropyl, dimethyl, octane. Now we put our numbers in. Our numbers for methyl are going to be three, four dimethyl and a five isopropyl. So that's 5 isopropyl, 3, 4 dimethyl octane. So now it's, now it's left is practice. Third one. 
third one is going to have. So third one. What do they do? They put the isopropyl group here, and they made. Is it that one? So let's do that one. So let's just take that eight carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's put the isopropyl group here, methyl, methyl. Okay, longest continuous carbon chain on that one. And so, so we can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if we did it like before. So let's say we come up here and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that way. So it looks like I have two chains now that I can choose from. So let's, so I always, you know, if I'm, unless I have color magic markers that I can use, which is just going to create chaos in my mind, I just write it again. So here's our eight. There's our eight carbon chain. How many substituents do we have? We got three. Now, does it matter whether I start here or here? No, because they're both methyl groups. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it like that. How many substituents do I now have? Four. And so the bottom numbering, the bottom longest chain gives me more substituents than the top one. So now this is going to be an octane, but now it's going to have what? Four different substituents. I'm going to number from top, oh, top here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many methyl groups do I have? Three. So I've got a trimethyl and how many and what else do I have? An ethyl? One ethyl at carbon three methyls at two four and five so that one's going to be three ethyl two four five trimethyl octane so the isopropyl group is is actually what seems to be an isopropyl group is part of the longest chain. So what you take away from this is those two molecules look pretty similar, but just the movement of a couple of carbons completely changed the, the longest chain. So you always have to check all the combinations for the longest chain. think you have the, again, it's going to take practice to make sure you got the basics down, but this, is there anything that's popping to mind right away? Let's take, let's take a quick five minute break. And then we'll talk about naming rings. Because naming the rings is going to require just a smidge of a change. Okay, so acyclics, our initial thing with these acyclopentanes is how do we name them? We're going to talk more about their um, some of their properties 
here in a few minutes. But let's look at the idea here of rings. So how do we how do we name how do we how do we name rings since we're into, since we're into naming here? And I'm also going to introduce here the idea of how you name a complex substituent. Now, what's a complex substituent? A complex substituent is one that doesn't have a common name, so it's not methyl, ethyl, isopropyl, etc. And so there is a systematic IUPAC way of naming an alkyl group. And now that we now that we've kind of been exposed to the to the system, it's actually a little bit easier. So I'm going to add one of those complex substituents onto these rings. But so if we have cyclic alkanes or cycloalkanes, all I'm doing now is I'm putting the carbon atoms in rings. So I can have a cyclopropane, which would be three, cyclobutane, which would be the square, which is four, cyclopentane, which is five and then cyclohexane, which is 6. And we'll talk more about the cyclohexanes at the beginning of class tomorrow. We'll end here talking about which one of the, how these rank in stability. But how would you name one of, name a ring that has substituents off of it? Well, number one, for the most part, rings are going to be parents. So this is going to be something, something, cyclohexane, something, something, cyclopropane. The rules are that we begin numbering at a carbon attached to a substituent. We're either going to go clockwise or counterclockwise, but what I want, in this case, since it's a ring, there's no beginning and end. So I can't say, well, number, start numbering at this end or this end. All I can do is say clockwise or counterclockwise, but I have to start at a substituent. So the IUPAC people, when they have their meetings on top of the big mountain, when they come up with the rules and they carve them in stone and send them down, they decided, well, how can we do this so everybody gets the same name? And what they said was, well, let's start at a group, but let's start at a group that and go clockwise or counterclockwise so I get the lowest sum of the substituent numbers. And that's going to be how we know where to start and whether to go clockwise or counterclockwise. And then if we have two of those schemes, let's start with the substituents of alphabetized first. Or if I can go clockwise or counterclockwise, the first substituent I encounter, is that one going to be alphabetized first or not? So alphabetization is going to break ties. So, example. Here is a cyclohexane. I would like, I have to start at a group. Let me ask, what are the groups? So, what is this group here? By now everybody says that's, that's definitely methyl. This one over here is That's isopropyl, and this one down here is ethyl. Okay. So we've got an, a methyl, an isopropyl, and an ethyl. Now I have to number this so that when I add up the numbers, that the numbers that a group is attached to, that sum of those numbers is the lowest. So here are some possibilities. Let's say I start at methyl. And I go methyl, and I go 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4. So I start at methyl and go clockwise. I have a group at number 1, number 2, and number 4. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 is 
7. So can I beat 7 in terms of coming up with a scheme that has a lower sum? Let's say I started with the isopropyl and went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So the circled ones. So that's going to give me a what? A 1 plus 4 plus 6, 11. That scheme's not going to work. If I started at the isopropyl group, yeah. one plus, sorry, one plus three, yeah. One plus three plus six. Ten. Still not seven. So now if I went and I started at the isopropyl group and I go to the methyl and then around in the square. That's going to be what? 1 plus 2 plus 5. That's going to be 8. Still not beating 7. So my numbering scheme then, the lowest one that I've found and the lowest one that's possible is going to be 1, 2, and four. So one, two, three, and four. So your so what's your gut instinct in terms of the numbering? We need to start at a group, but then if I have a cluster of substituents, I'm gonna probably start at one of those ends because that's the only way I'm gonna get the lowest number. And then in terms of naming, same rules. So in other words, now that I have my numbering scheme, I'm going to write my list before cyclohexane. I'm going to write my list in alphabetized order. So in this case, what comes first, ethyl, isopropyl, or methyl? Ethyl, so this is going to be a 4 ethyl. What? That's a good question. That's a good question. That's how it works. Where can you be doing the wrong answer? Wait a minute, I'm going to the wrong answer. So your question is if that pulls out the nice first, why, is that, why doesn't it get one by that? Because the rules are. Okay, this is like kind of cool, right? Because I say so. Because the IUPAC people say so. Because what they said was the numbering scheme has to give you the lowest total sum. That comes first. Then when I create my list, my list has to be an alphabetized list of statistics. So the numbering scheme is already there. Now, if I had two numbering schemes that would give me the same number, and I had a choice of starting at ethyl versus isopropyl, my tiebreaker would be start at the first substituent that's out of the class. But the numbering scheme comes first. So going one, two, three, four like that gives me the lowest sum. But when I create the list, I have no choice but to put the first out of the Oh, if I went up? Okay, so let's add that up. So one, three, and four is my okay. So I didn't need seven. I guess I'm anticipating the question of wall. Sometimes when you see a bromo because it's it, it's a B, you'll immediately like I want to start there because it's a B. Well. With cyclos, you've got to get the lowest sum first and then put that in here. So it's 4-ethyl. What comes next? Isopropyl? And then what's last? Mm -hmm. 
So 4-ethyl, 2-isopropyl, 1-methyl cyclohexane. Again, if you want to double check yourself, draw a cyclohexane, put an ethyl group on 4, an isopropyl on 2, and a 1 on methyl, and hopefully you get the same structure. I could rotate that ring around. I could flip it. But same name, same structure. So, in this case, all I'm doing is replacing the sum of the substituent numbers for numbering at the end closest to the first substituent simply because it's a ring, there's no obvious starting and ending point. So the IUPAC people says if you follow this, everybody's going to get the same numbering scheme. That's the next one. So, take a moment. What would the name of this molecule be? Remembering first step, lowest sum. Second step, if it's tiebreaker, it's based on alkalization. And then you can put all the names. That's a bromo and that's a chloro, bless you. And then there's two methyls. And the two methyls are attached to the same part. So it's just bromo. Yep, it's just bromo. Or chloro. But your two methyl groups are attached to the same part. If you're getting seven in your total sum, I can beat it. You have to add up all the six. This 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 problem is illustrating is illustrating how to, how you've got to deal with the numbers. Excellent question. So when you have the two methyl groups attached to the same carbon, do you have to count that number twice? Yes. You have to count that number twice. So when you have three numbers. So, so if you have four substituents, you have to be adding four numbers. So the math of this 
is that if I have four substituents, I need to add up four numbers. So if I have a carbon with two substituents attached to it, what does that carbon have to be? It has to automatically be number one. Because in this case, it's going to be one plus one plus the other two. And mathematically, there's no other way to get the lowest number than to start at the carbon with those two substituents. So that's why, that's why I'm going on to this problem to illustrate that point. There's no other way to get the lowest sum except by starting at the carbon with the two groups. So that's great, right? I can go one there, but now how should I go? Should I go clockwise or should I go counterclockwise? Should I go up and around or should I go down and around? It's gonna, is it the same numbering scheme? Yes. So it'd be one inside, two, three, four, and five. So it would be one plus one plus one plus three plus four. And if I had the outside, which I'll circle correctly, going counterclockwise or going clockwise in this case, that's going to be one plus one plus three plus four. So either way, seven, eight, nine. I guess I didn't beat your seven, but you didn't count the other fourth one in. So I'm tied. Which is fine. So now how are we going to break the tie? Alphabetically. So I want my numbering scheme to encounter the first alphabetical substituent between bromo and chloro, and that's going to be bromo. So I'm going to want to go this way. One, two, three, four, five. So it's the inside numbering scheme that's correct. So again, just to avoid confusion, my numbering scheme is going to be one, two, three, four, five. So this is a cyclopropyl, or so, sorry, it's a cyclopentyl. Cyclopentane is the parent name. What uh, what substituents alphabetize first? The Bromo, then the chloro, then the dimethyl. That makes sense, right? So it's going to go bromo, chloro, dimethyl, cyclopentane, right? It's going because B, C, D alphabetically. It's B, C, and M. So what do we got? Uh, what bromo? A three, a four, chloro, and then a one, one dimethyl. So again, if you leave out that second one, and you go back and try and draw the structure, or ask somebody else to draw the structure, they're going to go, okay, cyclopentane, I'll draw that structure. I'm going to put a three, a bromo at three, four, four on four. And then if it says one dimethyl, it's like, okay, where should I put the second method? Right. Right. I know, but the IUPAC people say that's what we have to do. And actually, it's not redundant. Because if all you have is the name, you have no idea where to put that second method. Yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not no, you don't. Because what if I put the methyl group on carbon uh, two? It says one dimethyl, but what if I had it at two? I would still have a one. I would still have a dimethyl, but 
if I didn't have the structure in front of me, all I had was the name, I could very easily say, oh, well, they forgot to put the 2 in, so it's 1-methyl, 2-methyl. Them are the rules. So we have, to, we have to make sure that the number and the prefix match up. So if you've got a try and you've only got two, two numbers, you've got to have a third, even if it's the same. So is this kind of making sense a little bit? <coughs> Oh, sure. Um, One chloro, three methyl, five propyl cyclohexane. What would you draw? So there could be nine different structures. There's nine of them. Hopefully they're all correct. Okay, so there's lots of different structures. Can it depend on whether you started at one or started on any of the six partners to set up number one? But I can grade each and every one of those and they're all right. 
So, is that a little bit easier than writing the name? So, if you get one of those, you get fewer of those. So, the idea is imagine what I should have done is I should have put, I should have made it like a one dichloro and then seen all the different structures people would have written. Because they weren't worried to put the second floor up. So that's why you have to match it up. So that's a little bit easier. And, and like I said, when you're doing a problem at the end before you check your answer, right, cover up the cover up the structure, or maybe even don't even cover up the don't even do that at after each problem, maybe do it after the third or fourth problem so you've forgotten about it. And then cover up the structure, write your answer, and then see if they match up. It's a real easy check. Because most people get the structure from the name right. It's a little bit less successful getting the name from the structure. Okay, so that's our rules. Just a little bit different than for, this, for the alkanes for the non-cyclic ones, but those are the rules and the applications of the rules. Now we should probably, I should probably just point out the fact that there is actually an IUPAC rule that says what happens if the chain that's attached to the ring is bigger than the ring itself? then you have to actually name that ring as a substituent. Right. What does that mean? That's this problem. So if I was to ask you to write the IUPAC name of this compound, the first thing that we see is that the substituent is bigger in carbons than the six carbons in the ring. Well, IUPAC immediately says, you know what? In that case, it's easier for us to name the alkyl group, or name the alkane, with the ring as the substituent. So in this case, if I treat this group as its longest continuous carbon chain, how many carbons do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I've got seven. So this molecule is going to be a heptane. So what is that ring going to be called then? Well, how did we name the substituents from the alkanes? Where did methyl come from? The reason it's a methyl group is because it started off as a methane that took a carbon or took a hydrogen away so I could stick it onto something. So in this case I've taken my cyclohexane and taken a hydrogen away from it so I could stick it onto that ring. So this should be a cyclohexyl group. So this is going to be a cyclohexyl. So same, same philosophy. It's a cyclohexane minus a hydrogen, so it becomes a YL. So that is now a cyclohexyl. Alphabetized on what? What letter should I alphabetize that on? I hear H. I hear a C. Any other letters? Now, why would I ask you that question? Because it's like, we didn't go over that. I know. I know. But what did I say earlier? Usually when I'm, usually when I'm asking, like, well, what did I say, like, two days ago? I was like, oh, my God, two days ago, I barely remember. This was less than an hour ago. So... Any hyphens in there? No, so that means it's all one word. 
So when it's all one word, what did I add as my to C at the beginning? So this is just like I said. So this is C for cyclo. What if you have multiple cyclos in there? Then keep going until you find the difference. Cyclohexyl will come before cyclopropyl. Okay, let's let's go over that list then. Which which ones do we not alphabetize on the first letter? Give me an example. Di, di, tri, etc. We don't alphabetize on the first letter. We don't alphabetize on the first letter if there is a hyphen. So secbutyl alphabetize on secbutyl B. Terfutal. B. Neopental. Yeah. Neopental, all one word. Yeah. So we don't alphabetize on die, cry, etc. We don't alphabetize when there's a hyphen. We go to the to the to the um meth, eth, et cetera. What else do I have here in this molecule? I got a cyclohexyl and I got a methyl. And how am I going to number this from left to right, right to left? Left to right? We agree left to right? And try. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, definitely one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So this is a heptane. So what is so what is this going to be called? Three, three cyclohexyl, four methyl heptane. So the IUPAC rules will allow us to name the, will allow us to name the ring as a substituent when the substituent has more carbons in it than the ring does. Any, no. Let's see what the question is going to be. Uh, what happens if um, the substituent has like six carbons in it? Then they're tied, then it probably goes defaults to the ring. So it's probably, and again, this is one of those rules that I never get to, but it's it's going to probably be when it's over six in the substituent, that's when you have to. I, I thought your question was going to be, I'm not sure, you try it psychically and figure out what's going to be, well, what happened if there was something attached to that ring? What if there was a methyl group attached to the ring? We're not, we're going to ignore that. Because then what you end up with, then you have to put a number on this, like we'll have so good. And so then you have to have a prime number. And so we're ignoring that. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's usually somebody's question. What happens if there's something attached to the ring? Well, if there's like a methyl group attached to car carbon like two, like this is carbon two, then that would be a two prime methyl cyclohexyl. But right now, your heads are about to explode with all of this new information. So we'll, in the sake of, you know, you can't, you can't be productive as a headless torso. So we'll keep your head from exploding right at the moment. That's actually what you would do now. So again, the idea here, that's naming that cycle hex that goes back to those fundamental rules. So that's how we would name it. Okay. Let's, let, me, let me just kind of talk a little bit about rings and then, then we'll see where we want to go next. So let me go back to the beginning. Okay, so naming rings are great. Let's, let me just talk a little bit about 
it's in terms that I've endured so far. And that's the idea of what is, what are isomers? And what kinds of isomers can we have? So, it's possible in rings to have a new type of isomer. But then again, we don't have an old type of isomer, so what should I, what should I talk about here? And let me just add in, did they talk about different isomers in the textbook so far? Like, what is, um, what are isomers? If I said I had two isomers, what does that mean? Rhetorical question. So what are isomers? Isomers are two molecules that have the same molecular formula. Generically, that's what isomer means. And then there are different types of isomers that are more specific. Let me give you an example. C two H six O. Can I draw different structures that have two carbons, six hydrogens, and an oxygen? Here's two structures that I could draw. I could say I have a CH3, a CH2, and an OH. Or I have a CH3 attached to an O attached to another CH3. Those both have two carbons, six hydrogens, and an O. But what's different about them? The atoms are bonded differently. They're, it's a different connectivity. And so there's, there's two terms that can be used to, for these specific types of isomers. And those are usually those are called either structural isomers or they can be called constitutional isomers. I, I'm old school, I like structural isomers, I don't like constitutional isomers as a term. So these are two molecules with the same molecular formula that have different structures. They also have different names. One is ethanol, one is dimethyl ether. Do we know that yet? Well, ethanol you may have some practical experience with. Dimethyl ether, probably not. From yesterday's discussion about intermolecular forces, oh my god, that was yesterday. Um, ethanol is going to have a higher boiling point because it has, it has a hydrogen bond and dimethyl ether doesn't. So it's going to be dipole-dipole, whereas the hydrogen bonding will be in the ethanol. Dimethyl ether, you know, be a gas, ethanol be a liquid. So these are structural isomers. The same structural isomer, though, the same connectivity can have two different three-dimensional structures. So for instance, if I have a cyclobutane ring, and I have two methyl groups attached to it. I could attach those two methyl groups because attached to the carbon also is another hydrogen. I could attach those methyl groups to the ring so that the two groups could be on the same side of the ring, above or below, or the two methyl groups could be on opposite sides of the ring and there's no way to make the groups that are opposite side of the ring be on the same side of the ring unless I break the ring apart. So, but they're the same connectivity. So these are different three-dimensional structures. So whether you have the methyls on the same side 
or whether you have them on opposite sides, they have the same overall structure of a butane ring with two methyls attached, one, two. And so those are called stereoisomers because they have different three-dimensional structures. And that's what stereo means in chemistry, different three-dimensional structures. So that's something that was not part of alkanes. Because when we are part of a non-cyclic alkane, if I just have a hexane ring, I can rotate the methyl groups all over the place. I got free rotation. In a ring, I don't. And so those are two different two different three-dimensional structures. So those are stereoisomers. So stereoisomers are basically the same structural isomer but with different three-dimensional structures. And the reason I show you that is because that's new. So for instance, a cyclobutane group, I could put my two R groups on the same side of the ring or the opposite side of the ring. Now when I introduce this term R, everybody should be looking at the periodic table going, wait, there's no R on the periodic table. There isn't. R means any kind of alkyl group. So R is like generic. It could be two, it could be a methyl, it could be an ethyl, it could be a propyl, it could be something complicated that we can't name yet. It just means I've got two alkyl groups attached to it. I can put them cis or trans. Uh oh, what does cis or trans mean? Cis means that they're on the same side, and trans means that they're on the opposite side. So I might as well introduce those terms now. So when these are on the same side, I could say, well, that's cis, and that's trans. So this is a new feature of rings that we're going to have to deal with, particularly with cyclohexane rings. We're going to have to determine, are the two groups on the same side or are they on opposite sides? So that's a new, a new feature of rings. And as the next slide will say, you can't convert one into the other unless you break the ring apart. So again, this is trans because they're on opposite sides. This is cis because they're on the same side. So new feature we'll deal with tomorrow. So how do we represent that the two groups are on the same side or on opposite sides? So here's what I, here's, I'm going to introduce a new way of drawing three dimensions in two-dimensional space, maybe. Remember we talked about tetrahedron, tetrahedra yesterday. I could, the best way to draw a tetrahedron to show that it's in three-dimensional space is to use bold and dashed wedges. So a normal bond, these two bonds, are going to be in the plane of the screen or in the plane of the paper. But in a tetrahedron, let's see, if we have a tetrahedron over here. So, 
this is the geometry, and so if I wanted to run the tables on the board, it's going to look like this. This bond and this bond are in the front of the board. This bond is for you, and this bond is away from you. So bold wedge, that way. So that's how we represent what we bond to towards you or away from you. And it's a way to represent three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. And so this one would be in front or toward you. And this one is behind or away from you. And so if I'm up here looking down on the cyclobutane ring, the ring's going to look like it's in the plane of the board. And so then my two R groups, my two alkyl groups, could either be above, and they're cis, they're on the same side. So this would be cis if they were above the plane. This would be cis, but in this case the two groups are below. And what would the trans look like? One up, one down. Does it matter? Like one up, one down, or one down, one up. Does it matter? In the future it's going to matter, but right now all we're concerned about is are they on the same side or are they on opposite sides? So now I can basically represent that cis and trans possibilities for the ring in a two-dimensional space by writing by writing them like that. And we're going to do this we're going to write this tetrahedron of the carbon in that bold and dashed format a lot. Okay. So that's new about that's something new we need to know about rings. That makes sense. A nod, yes, or a no, or hell no, I don't understand that would be some sort of feedback. I know. It's this is day three. Now I know why it's been a now I know why it's been a while since I've taught summer school. And all that stuff I had at the beginning, we're not going to make the, make it through that today. That's okay. We'll start for now. I can see when heads are going to explode. So let me just finish finish kind of talking about rings here. All right. So cis and trans are unique. We only have two things on the ring. So if I have just two things and I say, oh, they're cis, then you have no problems. Okay, yeah, they're either both on the top, both on the bottom, but there's only two things. What happens when you go to three things? You can't use cis or trans anymore. In other words, if I said, what's that? You might say, oh, well, that's cis. But if you're saying it's cis, what do you, you're assuming that I'm talking about the same methyl groups, right? But I've got a third group. Well, no, it's not cis because the methyl and the ethyl group are trans. So when you have more than two groups, you can't use cis or trans. And you can't use cis or trans to name the molecule. But you could say, hey, yeah, the two methyl groups are cis, or the methyls and the ethyl are trans. But you can't use this as part of the naming system. So 
the sys and trans come into play when we're naming. So for instance, take any one of the problems that I, any problem that has two groups, if I put two bold wedges, you'd have to put sys in front of the name. If I put a bold and dash wedge, you'd have to put trans in front of the name. If it has three groups, it can't be sys or trans in the name. It'll be R and S, and we'll get to that next week. All right. Last, last couple things here. So I got a three, four, five, and six member brain. Are these found in nature? Absolutely. Even the three-membered ring is found in nature. Now, on here it says the three-membered ring is less stable and the six-membered ring is the most stable. How do, how do you come up with that conclusion? Well, let's, let's imagine for the sake of argument that the ring has to be planar. And the three-membered ring has to be planar because it takes three points to define a plane. So cyclopropane has no choice but to be planar. Now, all of those are sp3 hybridized carbons. And from yesterday, we know that an sp3 hybridized carbon is going, yesterday or Monday, that it's got to have a 109 and a half degree bond angle. But in a, in a triangle, those are 60 degree bond angles. So what does the carbon do? Bend its orbitals? No, it can't. So what it does is it kind of just only partially overlaps. They're not true head-to-head. -head. They're kind of like skewed a little bit. So what that does is that makes that carbon-carbon bond a little bit weaker. Now, one of the misconceptions is, is that that is so weak that you can't find it in nature, which is not true. If you go out, um, there's, a whole, there's a whole chemistry of what are called natural products that you go out and you find things in nature and then you test them to see if they have any kind of anti-tumor or anti-cancer activity. Um, the most famous of these is a drug called Taxol, which you can extract from the bark of the California yew tree that grows in Oregon. I, don't, I never understood that. But if you go out and you get that bark and you basically extract it, it has anti-tumor activity. If you keep separating components after components, you get it down to one compound that's called Taxol. Problem is, not enough California U bark to cure everybody's cancer. So then you've got to figure out what is it and how do I synthesize it, which they've done. And it's commonly used for ovarian cancer and other things. When I first started teaching, it was in one of the clinical trials. If you go out to Hawaii and do some scuba diving and grab some sea urchins, they're not happy. They're not happy to come into captivity because you're going to extract the compounds from the sea urchin. Sea urchin, blender, not a good combination. So you're going to take the compounds from the sea urchin or from the coral, and you can actually find lots of compounds that have these three membered rings in it. And so they exist in nature. They're just not as stable as other rings. So, skew. These are skew angles. Uh, square is not much better because now, okay, we're at 90 degrees instead of 60, not bad, but still not 109 and a half. Five membered ring, now we're at 105, pretty good matchup 105 to 109. The only issue there is that for those cyclobutanes and cyclopentanes, they don't like to be planar, and we're going to see this more tomorrow, why? But they don't like to be planar because these two hydrogens, remember those are big balls or big balloons of electron density? If they're right on top of each other, that's bad because they're repelling. So that ring kind of puckers, got to say that carefully, it puckers so that the hydrogens aren't getting away from each other as much as they can. In a five-membered ring, you end up with like what's called the envelope shape. And so five-membered rings are very common. They're more stable than fours, more stable than threes. Our biggest issue is that if I went to a six-membered ring, 
if I go to a six-membered ring, I've now pushed the envelope on the other side. Because now this, if it was flat, would be 120 degrees, and now I've gone over my 109 and a half. But yet cyclohexane is the most stable of all. Why? Because it puckers. Only what it does is it drops the carbon down and it pushes the carbon up so that it makes this, which if I removed all the hydrogens would kind of look like a chair. And so it's called the chair conformation. And so the cyclohexane is so is very stable. It's the most stable. There's no all of this trying to fit a hundred nine and a half bond angle into a sixty or a ninety or a one oh five is called strain energy. And there's no strain energy for a cyclohexane. So that's gonna be where we're going um, tomorrow so that um, we can see how that how that works. All right, so what did we what did we talk about and what are we going to move to tomorrow? It's all the third day and I'm already behind. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Um, tomorrow we're going to... So today we talked about alkanes, branched alkanes, cyclic alkanes. We'll, go, we'll do quickly the bicyclic compounds tomorrow. And then we will do the conformational analysis. So basically we'll do 2.5 down to as far as we get probably probably into just starting 6.1 so what should you do for homework I would do 2.0 to 2.4 if you're keeping up with the problems go 2.0 to 2.4 oh then you're good in the book. Not, um, we're going to do five tomorrow, so if you, you understand it and do it, that's fine. If you want to wait until we go over it tomorrow, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I, I mean, we could go into hyperdrive here, but... Your, the glazed looks are just going to be more and more glazed looks. However... Here's what you can do for tonight, what I would do. I would go back and maybe you could reread that. Now, in, the, in here, in the Canvas site, what I have done is I have placed a lot of stuff for today, which I may, I'll probably leave there, but then I'll move some of it into tomorrow's. I found the matching videos that go with the notes. So, for instance, we're going to talk about naming bicyclics tomorrow. So, what I'd ask you to do is to, if you've already read that, fine, maybe reread it. Um, there is a video on naming bicyclic compounds here. It's that one. Then there is, um, that goes with the notes. Then there is drawing Newman projections, that video there. And that goes with this, with these notes. And then how to convert Newman project, and we'll talk about that. There are problems here. The problems are naming problems, so you got lots of naming problems to try. So I would try those in preparation for Monday. And so I can tell you the exam will go through what we finish tomorrow in class, but we will not be finishing 6.5 tomorrow. I think at best we'll probably finish. Um, 6.1 and I actually did some 6.1 I did some 6.1 today with the, with, the, with the isomers so those that's where we'll go that's where we'll go tomorrow and then next then next week we'll do RNS we'll do RNS right after the exam okay. alright so that's so that's if you haven't done any 
of the problems yet in chapter one or chapter two, that's now's a good time to get caught up for Friday. And then if you want more naming problems, like I said, Boku naming problems in here. So and if you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'll be here the rest of the day so you can, if necessary. Um, okay, so that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna do tomorrow and I will and every day I'll try and bring you this sheet that's sort of like this is what we're gonna go over. All right, so I will see you tomorrow, but any questions, by all means, send me an email.